In David, we see something very new in Israel. We see a transition from what is called charismatic leadership, that is, the, the Spirit of the Lord choosing someone for a particular time, a particular situation to lead his people. And with David, we see a change to the centralization of power to the kingship. And even more than that, the kingship becomes hereditary. So we will talk about here how David becomes king and some of his major achievements. After Saul's death, David is crowned king over Judah at Hebron. And he is very careful not to alienate the followers of Saul because there is going to be a lot of potential conflict. At the same time, however, Abner makes Ishbosheth or Ishbaal, the son of Saul, king over Gilead, the Asherites, Jezreel, Ephraim, Ephraim and Benjamin, and all Israel. And there is a long war between the house of Saul led by Abner and the house of David. But throughout all of this, David grows in strength. Eventually, Abner turns against Ishbosheth and works to bring Benjamin and Israel to acknowledge David as king. David takes Michal back into his household where earlier Saul had given her in marriage to somebody else. The other descendants of Saul are either killed or put in custody. And this is because when you have a situation like this where one king has died and another of a different line is taking place, there can be t continued conflict over the years between the two houses. Abner is killed by Joab, David's general, in revenge for the death of Joab's brother. This is not with the approval of David, and David mourns for Abner. Ishbosheth is killed by Rechab and Baana, who in turn are killed by David for doing this. And eventually the tribes of Israel make a covenant with David and they anoint David king over Israel. So all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, We are your own flesh and blood. In the past, while Saul was king over us, you were the one who led Israel on their military campaigns. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel and you will become their ruler. When all the elders of Israel had come to King David at Hebron, the king made a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. At this point, David conquers Jerusalem and makes it his stronghold, the city of David. The advantage of this is he is trying to unite a number of different tribes. He is trying to avoid having his uh, court at the same place where Saul did. And the advantage of Jerusalem is that this is not a city which has belonged to any of the other tribes. It is ruled by the Jebusites. So the king and his men marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites, Jebusites who lived there. And it says that David captured the fortress of Zion, which is the city of David. And he took up his residence in that fortress and he built up the area around it and he became more and more powerful because the Lord God Almighty was with him. So he's basically choosing a neutral place of rulership, something like the way Washington, D.C. was chosen to be the capital of the United States. 
the advantage of that is you don't have a city that belongs to any of the other states. And with Jerusalem, it does not belong to any of the tribes. David then rescues the Ark from oblivion, bringing it to Jerusalem. And this is what is considered to be the beginning of a royal theology. In other words, the king is associated with worship. So David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Baalah in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the Ark. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Aminadab, which is on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guiding the new cart with the Ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sistrums, and cymbals. However, Michal, who seems to have come back to David's court reluctantly, despises David as he dances before the Ark. And it is said that she is then barren for the rest of her life. And this makes it clear that it will not be one of Saul's line who continues on the throne. Later in his reign, David breaks the Philistine control over Canaan and makes war against other nations. He limits the independence of the tribes and establishes courtiers and royal officials in Jerusalem. The problem here is you have had what has been called a confederacy of tribes. Each tribe is somewhat independent, but at the same time, the tribes have requested a king. But you can't have the same kind of independence and expect to have an effective kingship. So there's a real dilemma here. How are you going to uh, 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 unite the tribes? under one king. And as we will see, this unity does not last very long because you have two kinds of rulership competing with each other, the independent tribes and cities and a king over all of them. It is not a very good match. At this point, we have the problem, David is king, and yet there is tension because the queen, Michal, is barren. So who will succeed David? Is there to be a very temporary king? What is to happen going forward? And here we have the promise to David made by God. This is called a covenant in Psalm 89, 3-4, through 4, not specifically in the Samuel text. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to my servant David, I will establish your descendants forever and build your throne for all generations. Now, the Mosaic Covenant shares a structure that is similar to what we have seen to be the ancient Near Eastern suzerainty treaties, the, the treaties between an overlord and a minor king. The covenant with David shares the ancient Near Eastern concepts of the king and the temple. The Son of God in the ancient Near East considers that the king was a sacred person, a representative of God, through whom the divine order was mediated. The temple was the center of the world, a meeting place of heaven and earth where creation was renewed. 
the king was typically a temple builder, hence David's quest to build a temple for God. David is the anointed one, and in his view, the temple of Zion would be the divine meeting place. While in the ancient Near East, kingship is seen to go back into primordial times, in the Bible, it is something new. But it is interesting that this is not associated with Saul, because during the reign of Saul, the Ark of the Covenant, which would be the center of a temple, is in um, Philistine hands. And so there is not the effort to build a temple. So let's look at the text in 2 Samuel 7. So it begins with the fact that David wants to build a temple. He said, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. And Nathan, the prophet, at first says to the king, go, go ahead and build a temple. But the word of the Lord says, do not build a temple for me. I have been perfectly content with a tabernacle and I have not commanded you to build me one. Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of earth. He also promises that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from forth from your body and I will establish his kingdom. So the house is not a house of cedar, but a dynasty. I will not take my steadfast love from him as I took it from Saul whom I put away from before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Okay, this is much more like God's promise to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis. It is a promise. It is not a covenant like the covenant in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, but rather it is an outright promise by God to David. David's response is, you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now therefore may it please you to bless the house of your servant so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. So again, similar to the words that God gives Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis.